question, so why do I like leave my wife and kid in a hotel without Wi-Fi? So that's like a nightmare. So how do will they survive the night uh, to talk to you? It's because other people did it for me, right? So I was on the other side, and then I listened. I had mentors, and if you ever feel that you are slightly ahead of somebody else. Please pay it forward. That's what you, as a good business person, always do. And so this is why I'm here. I'm breaking my little mini vacation because I hope one thing that you hear tonight, you'll remember somewhere in the future and that will prevent you from doing exactly what I did. And that's all. We'll, we'll save a lot of time. And um, since we all live around 85 years, time is it's not something we'd like to waste. So I hope it will save you a couple of weeks, hours, or minutes, it doesn't matter. I hope to give you something uh, of today's talk. So my experience um, with Lean Startup came kind of late. At the moment I already had financing. So I had an angel um, a VC fund paying me around a half a million dollars and I never heard of Lean Startup right at that moment. So it was kind of a late moment. That was... Um, December 2010 when we draw all the papers and my first experience with it was reading a book it's called Nail It and Then Scale It um, from Nathan Fur and uh, Paul Armstrong and the reason why I read that is uh, because Paul was in the same room because he was one of the VCs that was asking money for it he, he had written that book so I'm like I need to know everything about all these people that are in this room I read that book finished it and around that time I also had a proposal from their VC fund to fund convert and right before they deposited the amount of money I said to them I think I'm gonna kill the product are you still okay in giving me money <laughs> because I read your book and I think we are on the wrong track and I think I would like to pivot should be okay with that. <laughs> and so the contracts were signed. That was about to get that money on my bank account. It was around $150,000 that was coming that week. And they said, sure, thank you for admitting it. Um, in small companies, we don't really invest in the product. We invest in the entrepreneurs. And the entrepreneurs if you stay in the same area and there's another problem that you think you can solve, we're good with that. So that is my first experience with Lean Startup and then I basically broke down the product, killed it and started again using the whole Lean Startup methodology. And this is what I would like to share with you, what happened at that particular moment. So a little bit about my background. I was four and I started selling those, I don't know, you have those little books where the doctor falls in love with a lady and they get, have lived there. little notebooks that all moms always read, back then at least. I had those novels, my mom read them and she had stacks of them at home. And I saw a business, I'm like, you keep reading those and not using them again. So I packed it full of my backpack and I knocked the doors of all the neighbors and that's what I did every afternoon. I basically sold the books. 25 cents each, five for a dollar. Well, that was back then at Gilder, but that's what I did. Um, I got uh, more entrepreneurial because, of course, books ran out. And um, flowers are kind of like always available. Flowers from my neighbor's garden, flowers from the government, anywhere, parks, I can find flowers. I got them all together and packed them in my uh, bag and I went and knocking the doors and I started selling them. That lasted one afternoon and then like a neighbor bought me like this to my mom and says this is these guys stealing all the flowers from everybody and selling them. <laughs> so uh, that was a business and it failed. Um, so the first one failed I would say in three months, books ran out. Uh, the second one failed in um, one afternoon. And I had many more of these entrepreneurial failures and um, so we're somewhere from, from uh, 25 cents, eventually got up to $40,000. So 
selling software to enterprises that we all know. So, I was never really a school kid. I picked a university where we did type of MBA product based learning, uh, project based learning. So, um, that worked for me. And um, I, I would like to share a lot of, of the failures in between from here to there. And I think a little bit later, I wouldn't recommend it now in your life, but a little bit later when uh, and you're, you're getting settled down, I think Rich Dad Poor Dad is a, is a good book to read when you want to think about how you want to save some money for kids and stuff like that. This is an interesting book. But um, I failed a lot and I'm not embarrassed by it. I actually want to share it with you because... Um, and there's an awesome conference that's going in the world, I, I think it's now 70 countries, and it's called Fuck Up Nights. You said you heard of it? It's wonderful. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a welcome speaker there because I have so many fuck ups. Um, and it's all about entrepreneurs sharing their, their failures. And um, I would like to give you one reading recommendation. Google this, uh, it's called Chickapreneurs, it's a blog I wrote. It's a blog I wrote when I kept telling the same thing to the um, Startup Weekend um, teams. Like I was, I've been mentored like four times right now on Startup Weekends and I organized several. And each time they ask me the same questions and um, uh, why failing fast is is helpful and I would like to explain in short you have to understand this and I don't want to make fun of you but I will this is this is what happens this is your first startup normally how this goes is this is the level of difficulty of, of an item and this is time I feel like a teacher, so I'm like <laughs> using the board. <laughs> it happens when you're in a university. I guess. So, usually, on your first startup, it goes like this. You go to your mom. This is the mom moment. And you say, I have a killer startup. And mom says, I believe in you. You're awesome. It's going to be successful. You're going to be Bill Gates. That's good because I don't have a pension fund, so go for it. Then the next thing you're going to do is you're going to make a business card. I don't know if you still do that, but this is what I did. I have a whole list of these business cards. Pick a logo. Oof, important. Because if your logo sucks, you will fail for sure. <laughs> so the logo has to be good. Type font, everything is cool. You start handing them out and this scenario, I guess you're gonna start somewhere like a Facebook page, and you're gonna buy freaking everybody because you have like 2,000 people on your Facebook page. So you're gonna invite them all. You know those invites, right? All your friends have some sort of project and they like you, and you have to like it because otherwise you get dropped off the friends list, and you like it so you can unfriend it later when they don't know it anymore. So you like the Facebook page. And this is very close to being a successful entrepreneur. You're almost there. It's, it's nearly there. Uh, you're gonna build a product. This is like here. It's not that difficult, but it's not clear, close to this office. Facebook, maybe you follow a lean, lean, lean startup, so you have a product. And then in the end, you gotta do this. This one. The customer. <laughs> Yeah, I don't like it, but I have to do it eventually, right? It's like, it's usually right at the end where you have no energy or no cash anymore. And you're like, okay, I'll give it a shot. Ah, nobody wants it. The world is not ready for my genius idea. That's usually the response of a first-time entrepreneur. Or I'm too, too ahead of the market. Uh, something, it will never be your fault, of course. So this is usually how it goes. So you failed once in this, in this time. 
I'm proposing, and if you all read this Lean Startup stuff, then you, you know this already, but this is really, really, really what it's all about. So this is difficulty, time, you go talk to the customer. You fail, you go talk to the customer. You fail, you go talk, that's it. That's it. If your customer likes it, then the easy part starts, building a product and stuff like that. But the amount of times that you can fail, maybe 30 times more in the same time compared to trying it all in reverse. And this is scary, and this is not fun. <laughs> this is really not fun at all. I did 400 customer interviews of a half an hour. I recorded it and transcribed it, and this is because you're not getting anywhere. It takes months before you get somewhere. But it's the only way to, to one, become a little bit more humble, because an entrepreneur, your energy level are usually so high that you can conquer the world. But I did several of these projects, and when you do it in reverse, this is so painful. And failing. Like this was me on one project, changing the world of the handicapped person that wanted to use uh, computer equipment. I built a massive site, a marketplace, and it took a year, branded the name, trademarked the name in the US and in Europe. Let me see where this is going, right? I had logos. I had a website that can handle billions of people because obviously. I was gonna make it. So, and at that time, I flew to Los Angeles with a team of six, stayed at the Hilton, was the main sponsor of an event. And I stood on stage and said, I got the solution for you. And this is in the US, so you have to show a little bit like this stuff. And, and what do you hear? This. <laughs> Nobody cares. <laughs> They don't applaud nothing, and this is really painful. When you build a product like that, hiding it, it's just the pain is really bad. And you know when I start doing this, it's painful, I mean it's equally painful, but I'm not so attached to it. Because this product that I think is going to be a solution, I only came up yesterday. And today I launched it in the minimal viable product, landing page, some calls, and nobody wants it, I'm like, ah. Oh, Okay, move on. But 12 months developing, throwing around $40,000 into a product, that is painful. That was at that time a full year salary for me. So it was really hard to recover. That means recover means going back to your job. And working two years again, paying off stuff and building it again. So in total, wasted three years of my time just on one failure. That's, that's ouch. Now I have this constant debate with the Lean Startup people and I think I got kind of like a solution to it. When do you apply Lean Startup and when you don't? Because Lean Startup is not the holy grail, it's not the solution for everything. I hope you guys know the, the terms and I'll explain it short. A red ocean market and a blue ocean market. A red ocean market is a market where there's many products like yours. There's a lot of consumers or businesses that want it. So you can compare it to an ocean that's full of fish and many sharks and going to be a lot of blood. So that's a red ocean. And you have the other option which is a blue ocean you're going to be the first in a new defined market. In option number two, I would use Lean Startup. In option number one, I would go to the VC, get $10 million, hire marketers, and brainwash the hell out of everybody. Because that's the only way to get market share in the Red Ocean. There's already a lot of competition, there's a, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of money to be made, and the only way to get them is marketing. So at that time, you entered a market with a perfect product, with a perfect marketing combination, and millions of dollars. 
because that's the only way you can conquer that market. Now, you see maybe markets like this and saying, I still want in. The only option that I think you have is make a, blue, a red ocean a blue ocean. Which people in the red ocean are underserved that you can spin off and give it a twist? For example, we had a, a certain moment, I don't know if you know the company's Kissmetrics mix panel, and we have Google, Google Analytics. All three measure websites. At a certain time, all three of them had the same product. Google Analytics got way better, and then there were left Kissmetrics and Mix panel. There were paid products versus a free product. Except in Germany, everybody used Google Analytics. But what do you do? Mix panel said, we're going to do notifications and mobile, plus analytics. So they redefined a product where there was almost nobody. So instead of fighting Google Analytics and Google, they said, I'm adding this from this market with the product that I have, make a new category, and I go into that. There's almost no competition. I know the clients are less, but I can build a very strong uh, position there. So that's something you can do. And in the last one, I think you use Lean Startup. When you pick a red ocean, they start awesome, do 10x better everything, or die. And for the blue ocean, I would select the Lean Startup methodology. Now myself, I will never go into red ocean anymore, because I went into blue ocean, new competitors came in, it became really messy in my field, and now I'm spinning off in, into a different area again, because it's murderous in my industry right now. So it can happen during your, your startup as well. So in short, what I want you to do is um, apply the link startup and now I'll go a little bit um, more into which books you can use and how I did it. But what you need to do is not make stupid widgets. Startups take around eight years. I know it all looks cool from the outside, Instagram, one billion dollars, but what you don't usually read is the eight years before that where they struggled. Right? Twitter was something else before, and then something else before that. But these people were almost like, it's not an easy road. If you make stupid widgets just because you want to make money, you're going to run out of energy. You personally are going to run out of energy. Because it's not fun in the industry that you work in because you selected it for the money. Wrong choice. You need to really feel that you're going to contribute something to that industry, otherwise you're not going to end, end really well. Run out of energy as a personal entrepreneur, it's, it's not fun. I went through a dip of two years and it's, it's really tough. So pick something that you really want to solve. If you just because HipChat has something or Snapchat has something or whatever, and you want to build a clone of that, just forget it. It's just like, do it as a game. It's a practice of your development skills or something like that. But don't say, I'm going to commit eight years to that, because it's really difficult those eight years. Your first year, you have a lot of fun, a lot of energy, and then two, three years in, it's really difficult. Usually, people get bought after three years for almost no money. Because that's the moment where entrepreneurs give up. I read a, a, an interview with the guy in New Patel, maybe you know him, he runs um, a couple of interesting companies. And he said, um, we usually buy the, the, the entire company for almost nothing in three or four years. Because that's when the entrepreneur kind of like proven the product, but they didn't get any traction, and they're low on energy, so they'll take pretty much anything. So they give them $200,000 and then they grow that product. Because that's the moment where you run out of energy. Unless you pick something that you're passionate about changing. Now, how I did some of these lean startup? Um, I assume you read the book, or read the book, and I picked two other books that I think are really interesting and where I got my inspiration from. After that, it's called.
called running lean. And then they get that scale it. It then scale it. <laughs> I write like my teacher did. It's unreadable. Um, especially the first one, I think it's really interesting. It's the guy from Texas called Ash Maori. Because maybe, I don't know if you, you're you into this whole thing, start up, you read the book, and then you're like, uh, now? What about <laughs> tomorrow? I don't know. And Ash Maori basically says, good, I have templates for you. I have product interviews. This is what you do. And it basically runs down the whole thing in by weeks. These are the templates. This is when you kill a product. This is when you move on. And he's like, oh. Like a superhero for me. And he built a book as, as a lean startup. He just blogged about it every week and sent out a new PDF version to the world, all his readers, and then they corrected it. And I have one of those PDFs still, one of the last versions, all his notes and all these people sending back for it. I mean, it could be more advanced, but that's the way they went. And he basically got the book and he started selling it, and then he got a publisher, and then he, he, uh, he's now one of those speakers that you, you see everywhere. But this book gives you the practical tips. So what did I do to get from the moment where I said I probably need to kill the product to the new product? So like how do I make that jump? I knew I wanted to solve something in the industry of the conversion optimization. What happened was I ran a company, lead generation company in 2008 and some years before, and in 2008, I'm not sure what happened in French, but France, but in Holland where I was at that time, business kind of collapsed completely, 2008, 2009. And I was sending leads for SAP systems, URM systems, ERP systems, and stuff like that. And, um, and at that time, basically my whole traffic dropped to half. Because all these companies said, we're going to freeze budgets. We don't know what's going to happen in the world. I am right now not going to invest a couple hundred thousand dollars in an ERP system. I don't know if I'm going to survive this whole crisis. So half of the traffic left. But I had a baby that year. I was like, hmm. I really need that money. <laughs> uh, and it was like July when it... Yeah, when it became obvious that we would have serious problems in that year. And I'm like, okay, let's buy AdWords, right? Let's buy traffic. Now, when you're trying to buy AdWords, and Microsoft and SAP and Oracle also want to buy ads, my budget is not kind of sufficient. They were the guys in trouble. I was usually providing them leads and now they had to buy somewhere else. So I'm like, I cannot do this. The only option that I had, I didn't know how this was called, but like, okay, I got at least a couple of, I think I had 100,000 visitors to that site, normally 200,000. So I'm like, 100,000 people come, they need to double the applications. The only thing I could imagine that was the solution. So we built, uh, me and, and, and an employee in Romania, we built all these fancy widgets, we had all these a couple hundred sites and we had WordPress widgets that knew what keyword you used and what page you visited and we took the logo of Microsoft and that and we completely changed that site. Every time you came, the site completely changed because I knew exactly what you were looking for. And then I doubled the amount of boxes and I sold boxes. I gave three boxes away which turned into leads. And I managed. At the end of the year, I had 10% more revenue than the year before. I was safe. And then I was like, that's an interesting. It, I'm like, who's, who makes this stuff? We made it ourselves in WordPress plugins. But wouldn't it be awesome if everybody had the ability to do that? And we were very technical, so we could do things like that. But I assumed that everybody was that technical. And I wanted to give a tool that could do that. So we took that idea out of that company and the employee that I've never met that I hired at Elance for like five bucks an hour became my co-founder. Okay, I met him, I flew to Romania just to meet him for that particular purpose and he became my co-founder, technical co-founder. 
and me and Claudio worked, I think, a year. It's very typical. I, mean, I usually work a year on a product when it fails. Um, so I work a year on the product and then launch it. And it can do anything. I mean, it couldn't wash and stuff like that, but it could do anything in conversion optimization. It was tracking, personalizing. I knew what you were doing. I could watch your keywords. We did really advanced stuff. And then again, it almost felt like the hill to the couple of years before. I launched it to the, the world and said, yeah, I have the solution. Similar thing happened. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody cared. Uh, because I never build a list or anything like that. I have no idea how to market this, uh, how to find people. And after like a couple of months struggling, I have like 10 clients or something like that. And I'm like, um, this is not going to work, but the clients paid well, so maybe VC money? It's kind of weird nowadays, but at that time, I was like, I want to really build this company with VC money. So I reached out to one VC and I got my money. Um, so I have 100% pitch. Pitch rate, so I did one pitch and I got half a million dollars. And so that's why I would never want to pitch again, because this is an awesome number, like 100% uh, pitch rate. Um, when it failed, uh, because it was obviously not working, I almost had the money in the bank. And so what I did is I, with this book, I basically made a list from LinkedIn of all the people I wanted to reach out. So I batched it in groups of 50. 50 from LinkedIn, sent 50 emails, and then I measured 12 hours, 24 hours, 36 hour response times to the email, if they wanted to talk to me. And from that moment on, I got obsessed with measuring things. And anything that was not in the hint of them being interested, I said, okay, different email, different email, different headline, different this. And I start using batches of 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, until I had like a combination in that headline in the, in the LinkedIn, I just bought a master account in LinkedIn. This is what I did to my VC money. I basically bought lots of LinkedIn contacts and I started reaching out until I had the combination where the response rate in 12 hours was good enough for me to start call, calling these people. I used a script from Running Lean, uh, from the book. It has all these templates and you can download them in Word. Uh, they come with links in the book, so you can download them all, what to say in those interviews. And the interview is a lot of listening. It's about questions like, um, how do you do this currently in your company? So this is things, uh, very obvious things that you need to talk to. How difficult is it? If I would take it away, how much hours would it take you? How much money would it take you? And all these questions led eventually to two solutions. One thing you'll start noticing, if you're kind of an entrepreneur, and if you're remotely like me, you lie. You hustle. You got to get forward. You got to move forward. So everything you need to do is go forward. And that also sometimes means that you lie to yourself. And I noticed this. And I said, I'm steering these people into a solution that I think I like most. Okay, I stopped the process and like, this is not going to work. Because if I lie like this, I will end up with the same problem. Being at the Hilton and blah, 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 and nothing happens. So what I did is start doing interviews and I start sending the interviews. I recorded each one of them. I sent it to a guy in India to transcribe it for me. The transcription went to two people, one on my team and one on the investor's team. They made a summary, and so we did around 300 of them. 300 times half an hour transcribed, summarized, sent back to the, to the uh, analyst in the investor and to us. And then basically we got together and saying, what do you see? I already see things personally because I wanted to be that product because I like it myself. But what do you see? And what do you see? And with that, we found 
two products that everybody seemed to want. So we went deeper into it. And we never kind of found the one. We almost found the two. The f and so we said, we'll make it a combination. And that still haunts me today. That is like a failure after five years that still haunted me. Not picking one. Because nobody asked a combo. Nobody wanted the two. They wanted the one. But which one? And since I didn't know, I made a combo. But I, that's not what I asked. So anyway, we move forward and eventually uh, convert became what it is right now. And then maybe still on the site, and you, maybe you see the problem still. Let's see. Ah, okay. No, this is already changed. Ah, no, well, it's kind of like we ran a test recently, so we changed the headline. But if you looked a month ago, this said convert A B testing for agencies and e commerce. That was it. E commerce or agencies. You never serve two. Because if you serve two, they don't really either feel well attended. The software can never specialize in something. And so the message is always unclear. And so if somebody comes into your market with a clear message, serving one audience, they would always win. I now learn it. That's why Convert is not the biggest A-B testing tool in the world, even though we're one of the first out there. So something I'd like to say is, don't lie to yourself, ask for help, because you will lie to yourself. So ask for help, take recordings of your interview, and Running Lean says this, if you're going to meet somebody, ask somebody to join you. Pay them, or make them co-founder, it doesn't really matter. Your stock is worth zero on today. <laughs> I wouldn't split 50-50. Okay, That's, I did that several times, it always is a disaster. 49, 51. If you want to be almost equal, it <laughs> doesn't matter. But you're going to run into problems uh, all the time later on. So bring somebody with you. And then later on, ask when the interview is done, what did you hear? Without, without pushing whatever you heard, it's like, what did you hear? What did he want? Where did he was most interested in? Two people take at the same interview. One just for writing. One for writing and questions. But since I'm the entrepreneur, I usually get very engaged. I'm like, oh yeah, that's interesting. And then the conversation goes, blah, 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 blah. Um, so stick to a script. Ask the same questions to at least 10 people. Don't change your questions. Because as soon as you start changing, you start leading the witness again. You start leading it into a path that you like. Because the second one you heard, like, oh, I like that product. Now let's change all the other eight interviews. And you'll never hear that one person was a random or was really something that repeated. Same questions, two people in the room, make notes, and then move forward. Anything that is a signal, you should take as a signal. You send an email, they don't reply, it's not interesting. Period. Don't move forward. Yeah, but maybe it's busy. Well, if it is a huge problem, he would reply fast. If it's a yeah, then you end up at the bottom of the email list. So that's a no. And take it as a no. Don't don't lie to yourself and say, oh, maybe the busy vacation, oh, it's a wonderful day today, it's a sunny, blah, blah, maybe there's kids, blah, blah. If he doesn't reply in 24 hours, it's not a problem to solve. Bye, next problem. And this is hard, but so this, this, these things can be 24 hour loops. Imagine how many you could do in a year. So it's emailing, it's calling, cold calling, terrible, terrible cold calling. I hate it. Calling person, secretary, doesn't want to answer. And yeah, but I don't know, doesn't want to answer. It's like, ah, oh, that's part of your job. At a certain time, you start, you start getting into an area where you find response. And at that time, you start making your 
first 10 people your beta clients. You ask money. They do not get your product for free. And this, 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 the way I say Lean Startup is Lean Startup for business to business, not Lean Startup for consumers because I have no idea how that works. I think it's more in the ocean of a lot of marketing money in there and stuff like that. So I don't know how apps work for consumers and stuff like that. So this is business to business solving. Um, but first, thank clients, they, they always pay. It allows you to see their billing procedures, how that works, who needs to sign off, and if they don't want to pay anything, like nothing, a couple of hundred dollars, maybe, you're going to have that problem later on. So if you cannot get the credit card from somebody in the company and give you 200 bucks to start the first beta version, it's not going to happen in six months either. And don't lie to yourself. If you can't make $200 available now, you will not make it in the future. So I am not, I killed a product. And it's terrible. I killed, I don't know, 50? And on, I think, 6, 7, we actually started developing work. I mean, yeah, I still have one laying around somewhere there to code. And like, every time I look at it, it's like, oh, that's such a cool thing. I go to my co-founder, can we like, like integrate it somewhere? And he's like, nope, it, it'll go away. <laughs> but it's awesome. Anyway, I'll tell you what it is so you can steal it. Uh, I haven't found anybody. It was a tool that could tell you what I just told her. That websites fail for a particular reason. It would self-analyze the website and would say, these are the things that you can change. And we got really far. We had 50 uh, elements that we could test and we could find color, contrast, text size, the visualization, how people looked at it, it was really fancy. And I still love it, it's like my baby, but nobody wanted it. We had 500 people try it, one person paid $99, and that's it, killed it. <laughs> yeah, a lead gen tool, I know, but to make, like what we did, is, I'll tell you, this is lean startup, this is like, is being recorded, right? I'll tell my mind. It's a failed product. So this was a fully automated website scanning tool. It was auto match. So this is how we presented that. Give me your website, give me your email, and in two minutes you have a report that says all the things that you can improve. So this is what it says it did. Now I'll tell you what it really did. You gave the website and the email. You didn't send a text message. You sent to me at any time of the day. I woke up, <laughs> opened my laptop, got the site, checked all the check boxes if it had that or not, and then la la, hit send, make PDF, close my laptop, and okay. I did this 500 times in a week because I knew we could eventually build it. But this was our minimal viable product. We could <coughs> not build it. Part of the new startup is, even if you can make it, don't make it. Just pretend you have it. Which I did. I pretended 500 times to be the automated buggy. <laughs> so I woke up, checkbox, sent PDF, and the guy was like, <gasps> that's amazing! Thank you very much, I didn't sleep the whole week. <laughs> And I made hundred dollars on this. So besides the sleep and hundred dollars, it was obviously a failure. So the total investment time in something like this is like six hours of development time. On our minimal viral product, we did six hours. So we had a wonderful page. We had a form that was I would use something like Zapier or whatever you have nowadays. Uh, if then, then do that. Send a text message to my cell phone, and then I did the check boxes, and then I said. And it made a PDF. Well, the PDF generator was automated, so that was that was nice. So a landing page, PDF generator, and that was it. And me waking up to 500 times in one week. So, and you kill a product because you do this, and you, we wanted to see how many people upgraded to the full version of that, and whatever, and one person did that, and I thanked him with his hundred dollars, and I killed it. And it still hurts. 
So we killed a lot of these type of products, and you have to do that. And um, I think um, part of the process of getting to the right product is making a lot, or pretending to make a lot, doing a lot of talking to people, invite a lot of people over for coffee, start working a lot of phone calls, and don't do what you do well. If you can develop, don't touch it. Don't touch the computer. Because it's so tempting to make it. It's just five hours. Yeah, but if you can't sell it because you're the only co-founder, that's the skill that you need to practice. We know you can code. Great. Can you sell? Can you market? No, add a co-founder. So failing in that sense can also be like a coder that codes and then tries to sell, doesn't sell, learn from it. You can say, I take courses on marketing. Okay, add a co-founder. There's multiple ways of solving that problem. But in my experience, don't do what you do really well. And um, so along this whole process, and we don't need any slides, we basically learned that um, staying humble, all these people that we talk to are still people that I can reach out to. I still have them on chat. So even what in my industry are the gurus, I all have them on my Skype. Because five years ago, when we were all nothing, we were all just beginners, we talked to each other. And um, that's really nice. And right now, I think we learned a lot along the, along the path. Uh, most of the things I learned was um, pick one product, stick to it, learn when to give up. And um, that failure for the first year and a half is something you need to do many, many times. And for the Lean Startup, I was saying Lean Startup is really great from zero to your first 100 clients. And then you're like, okay. Now I need to grow. Then I would say other more traditional marketing practices come into play. But what we what we pull out of um, Lean Startup, every once in a while we have a new feature or a new spin-off that we'd like to test, and we follow the same Lean Startup procedure. So even though we have several very good clients, and I would say we're the first tool in the world that uh, in size that do what we do, uh, we're very comfortable where we are right now. Uh, we are we are by far the largest, but we follow the lean startup procedure when we have new features. And features can be do it's like you mail the tens of thousands of people that have our mailing list. Say you want to try a product, you have a landing page, you show a video, the video you really didn't make. It was just a keynote or a PowerPoint where you clicked on a product that was never made. You just ask the UX designer to make a fake product. We recorded the video, we showed people, do you want to have this, sign up, you can do the beta, five people signed up, kill the product. That's how we still do things. We mail thousands of people, five people sign up, kill it. We'll never make it. So I think it still applies in that sense, lean product development. But if you have your first hundred clients scaling, and it's, it's about finding the right marketing channels and all, all the other things you need to do. But, um, I hope some of this makes sense to you. And I think we have, do we have time for questions or do we do it over there? Let's do questions. Nobody? Good. Copy. Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, you said we shouldn't do what we do well. So I've said it's business. So you mean I should learn how to do software development? What, what elements of, a, of an entrepreneur you don't have developed? Like maybe you're really good at strategy. That's kind of like useless right now. There's nothing to... You can probably identify large markets, but can you convince me of buying your product? I don't know if you have that skill. I would train that or get a co-founder. Like I wouldn't write a business plan because you're good at that, which serves no purpose right at this moment because we know nothing. So like what I noticed, I, I started business well and I I wrote this plan, in my case it helped me getting funding, but it didn't help me get clients. Clients was just nasty, terrible. Calling and getting rejections. And so in that sense, I would, I would practice what you don't know yet. Because as an entrepreneur, you need to be very diverse. You need to be kind of like a designer, 
that knows your product, that understands a little bit of the coder, that knows in the future your strategy, you need to be nice to people, and you have to identify a billion dollar market on a problem that they really want to solve. So you've got to be kind of like everything in the beginning. So I would like to train all these things. I could do Photoshop, that's what I, I, I learned. I tried to, to do cold calling, kind of failed, but then anyway, it made an effort. And um, all the products that we had in the beginning, I did in Photoshop, I just stole it. I can do this and make it that, and I put it in PowerPoint, and then on click, and then record it to the video of a product we didn't have. I made all that. I'm like, I'm not really skillful on that, but I don't have any money to hire anybody. So I would definitely try if you have the whole package already, so you can do things yourself, and then see if you get people interested in whatever product. And if you have those skills, then you're ready to go. Usually people tend to have one thing really well, and they really aim on that. So I know, for example, designers, the first thing they do is build an awesome logo and landing page and all that stuff. And they don't really talk to clients. And it's like, like develop that a little bit, right? And salespeople only talk to clients, but they want to sell and they don't listen. And that's a problem. Salesperson are really bad for leading startups. Because they sell whatever they think get the most money, but it's not really resonating on the other hand. So you can't listen to the person, what do they need? And you just sell them whatever you think you sold them, but you can't go to a thousand clients. Um, well, do you think that helps? Not really. Okay, good. Yeah, I mean, uh, let's, let's go deeper, because I don't want to leave it like that. Yeah, it's more about um, the phrase, the sentence you said was really, if you're good at something, don't do it. So I want to learn from that, as PPC I know, and I know how to do business plans, but I don't know how to code. And right now I'm looking for a CTO. So should I try to learn myself how to code in that? Or should I just maybe continue trying to sell the app to potential customers and see how they react? Well, may I do an assumption that there is already some sort of app idea? Yes, there is. Does somebody like it? Yes, my mom. <laughs> <laughs> I like that you pay attention, but that was 45 minutes ago. <laughs> no, but I mean, yes, why, why would you need a CTO at this point? This is giving away a lot of shares or something that's nothing yet. What's the next step? You have an idea or not? Yeah. So uh, I think I really need to test it on my targeted customers. Is it a business to consumer? Oh, sorry, yes, consumer? Yes, it's BPC, yes. I would design first. <clears throat> I would learn a little bit, take some of the $5 apps, design your own app kind of wireframe thing, yeah. wireframe it, go to your target audience, what you think it is, show it, and see what happens. I would not look CTO, I would not look designer, just see if, there's, if there's re it resonates. If 100 people Say, I, I think you're onto something, don't move forward, but say, can I have your email address? And like, <laughs> <laughs> Get a hundred email addresses, because I think that's a very good validation. If somebody wants to give you an email address, it's like, it's like walking in the bar and getting a phone number, right? It's like, mm, we're getting somewhere. Uh, so I would go for that. And then you have like a hundred people that kind of understood what you wanted. And then I would say, okay, then it's the next step. I would go, even I would go into the UX design, not CTO yet, I would code it. I would see how long I can stay in screenshots and pretend app that doesn't exist before I jump to the real app. Like how, how much can you do without it? Like sometimes it's really, you need two people, it's a chat app. You can't really move that much forward before having the real app. But try and stay swimming in the dry, not touching the technology as long as you can and see how far you can go and then jump to CTO. I, I believe, sorry, that's not a question, but that's the problem is and how reliable is a test on the product that it means a finished product? It's difficult. It, because I said the business to consumer market is kind of like take it all kind of apps, right? Yeah. 
And a lot of the consumer apps, and I said, I have very little knowledge, it's like, they see it and like, ah, I get it. And it, it takes off. And I don't know the process. That, ah, oh, it takes off probably is a lot of testing. It's like, oh, it takes off, it's an iPhone. Oh, I think there was a process before that. We didn't just launch the iPhone. So there must be a process that I'm not aware of, how they do that, how they get that feeling from consumers. I know that business to business, I love it, because it's like, you like it? Good, give me $500, that's not even yours, that's your boss's. <laughs> give it to me, and I'll solve the problem, so you can go home Friday afternoon, two hours early to your kids. <laughs> They'll be like, here you go. <laughs> I mean, that's the business to business side. If it's, like, it's not even their money, if it solves a need, they really want to have it because it's usually not even their money. But on the business to con uh, on consumer side, getting 99 cents from somebody is a big deal nowadays. So it's, it's a lot tougher. So, no advice on that side. <laughs> <laughs> Can I add something? Yeah. So, uh, I advise you to make a simple landing page and uh, post it on several sites like Batteries, uh, Hacker News, and uh, Reddit, and so on. And uh, you will get immediate uh, uh, results and uh, reviews uh, by real people, and uh, you will get uh, around uh, several thousands uh, visitors. Yeah, so in several days. It, it's something I've already done. Oh, okay. And uh, nowadays I've got, I think, more than 250 uh, pre registered persons. That's and good. more than 1,000 followers on Twitter. So mm -hmm. I'm very happy with that. The problem is, I don't really know all those people, and I'm not sure if I launch the app tomorrow, those people will download the app and sign in. So that was my whole question is, even when you had to suggest your new idea to someone, uh, how do you define what is the clue to make you know that, okay, that's a yes, and that will be a yes in the future? I did really sneaky things. Stop the recording, please. <laughs> <laughs> I did things like pay now and get it. And I didn't have it. And I started AdWords campaigns, selling, selling, selling. And I refunded everybody. And you want to see the conversion rate, I want to see how much I really signed up, was it a real product? I didn't have product. Sorry. Ask forgiveness <laughs> before permission. I did things like that because, I mean, how, how, I mean, PayPal did shit like that, really. PayPal, like, Please click here and like, oops, I uploaded your entire address book. <laughs> PayPal did stuff like that. You cannot imagine that right now. But I did all that, that, that stuff in the past. And that's all hustling. You gotta like ask for permission, but not too much, and then do it anyway. Sometimes just move forward. Um, so even selling things that you don't have. Say the list. We have 100 of them right now. And move them from Twitter to that list. See, you know, see what happens. Do they really move? If they don't move, there were all your friends on Facebook that went to Twitter, and all your mom said, he's my son, I like him. And nothing really happened. So see if, if you can get as close to something. And sometimes it, it's, it's good to maybe hire a designer and say, build three pages of the app and the UX and put it on a landing page, do a slider, give your email address to be in the pre-list next week. And then never launched it in the list if it is not, not growing enough. In general, I think you should never stay long in a project, and especially in this stage, I would, I would say no more than two, three months. If it doesn't move, it's not moving. I mean, you should do these things on, on something, every, on this product every day, right? So it's not like once a week everything. Every day you do something and after three months it's not moving in any direction. Just get it, unplug it. It's just the hardest part, but I think you should really train to unplug products. Because the more you learn that, I think the easier it is to do, to get to the right time, to the right product. Better? Yeah. Getting better? <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry I, I took your no, question. No, no it's you know. You have also a question. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, you have to wait even more. <laughs> Show something and 
Well, there's 24 hours of the day. An entrepreneur in the beginning doesn't do much else than work. Let me split the question in two. Um, the first part is how do you do the interviews and when you show a product, right? So, the running lean is very defined. There is problem interviews and solution interviews. And the, product inter the, uh, the problem interviews is all about listening and digging deeper. It's like, so what are you struggling with this week? Ah, oh, I struggle with the week that I find the night I leave stressed. Okay, that doesn't really help. And so the methodology there is why, 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 why? It's like asking all those questions. It's like, okay, so why do you leave stressed on Friday night? Well, because I never get these reports done. What reports? Ah, oh, Friday afternoon we have to get the reports because on Monday it's like, okay. How much time do you spend on Friday? I'm like, I hate going to work on Friday. I start at 8, but I'm done at 6 or 7. And when it's supposed to be kids' time, and then they go, I'm like, okay, 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 thank you. So you work almost all day on these reports. Yes. So that's like 8 to 10 hours on this report. This is a real problem for you. It's almost 20% of your entire time you work on this report. Yes. So if, if the report was solved, you would be happy, right? Yeah, I would love it. That's so complicated. I get it, but I would take that as an idea, and then I would explore it further, and it's like, okay, how much is that worth? Like, try to give me a ballpark, and I notice it's really difficult for clients to give me that. So I always thought, like, with what model could I work? I do the 10x of that, and then start starting there. So if I think it, that's worth five thousand dollars, I said, would it be worth five thousand dollars for you? Because in business to business, some things you go nuts in, in pricing. So you can better start high, you can always go low, but if you start at 500, you can never go up. So I started at 5,000. Would $5,000 a month be worth that the reports are done at 12, not at 4? Yes. Or no, or whatever. So you go down in pricing, and then you try to find a group of people that have the same problem. You're trying to zoom in. So you have a batch, and I, I batch them up usually in 10 or 50. And because you need a batch of similar people, and then see if they all say the same. And you can say how fast did they respond to my email, how fast did they take on the phone, uh, how many times did I need to reschedule that call. It's all signals that later on will be very beneficial for you when you do the analysis. And then you find him, and the second stage is you found two people out of 50, that have a problem, I would kill the product. I would still not move forward. It's not a percentage that makes me move. We have eight, ten people in that. We're like, okay, that's an interesting problem because if I multiply that by the entire population, that's a big market. So you zoom in and you find out with other interviews, Microsoft and SAP are really poor reporting tools. And these companies are willing to spend two thousand dollars to have five hours less work on Friday. Okay, that's great. Then I'm going to the next stage. It's called solution interview. You do verify of the things that you first heard, like the price range. You verify the problem, but you say now the problem. You say, I noticed on several interviews that people are really having problems with Oracle, Microsoft, and SAP reporting, and it takes eight hours of their time, they see less of their kids, is this something that resonates with you? And they'll be like, you mix that group with the old group and the new one. You try to find 50 new. So you found 10 in the first group. You need to find 40 new ones and then go again. And, and then, but now you're more defined. You go in with the 10, you go in saying, I found this and the other 40, you say the same. And they say they're willing to pay $2,000. And if they are live in front of you, look in their eyes and be a lot of silence. Don't keep talking. You're not a salesman. You're trying to see what happens. On phone calls, lots of silence. It makes the person on the other side very uncomfortable and they start talking. Because somebody has to say something. Which is great for me because if they're talking, I can listen, I can write. And the more they talk, the more they tell about their processes, about the budget, about their frustrations, the more they don't. And then I would say, okay, so summarize. You're interested in a product that cuts down your reporting time by half on this type of platform. 
and you're willing to spend in a range from 2000 to $2,500 a month to be able to do that. Am I right? Yes. Okay. I have a solution. We are building something. For this project, I would like to be in your office on Friday afternoon and see how that process goes. Would you like me to join? We're now signing up people for two and a half thousand dollars, but instead of one month, you get four months. And if it's not working out, I'll refund you. Are you good? So I'm collecting money. So the people that verified of the 50, maybe 20 say that's a, that's a problem they have. Of the 25 say yes, that's a 25% range. I would go for this product with $10,000 in your pocket. And what you do is you go with two people on a Friday afternoon, you go and watch this product. Watch the process. Record it, video it, do interviews, continue staying with your client. They are your first clients. We don't have a product yet, we're just watching. So we took the money, we're watching. Why is it so important? Well, that person just paid me two and a half thousand and has a consultant next to him helping him solve his problem. He feels like a king. So you're paying for ego boost. Right now, you're not doing anything. <laughs> business to business, this works really well, by the way. When you say watching? You watching. You're just watching and asking him questions what he does on this. Next stage is you hire an expensive consultant. You help him make those reports better. You make those reports. You're now actually going into the tech, but you're not making a product. In the system, you're trying to understand why it is so complicated that he has to take eight hours for this report. And then you come back and say, good, we now sold a couple. How complicated is it? And is there a way to make it easier? If there is no way to make it easier for the amount of money that you took, you have to kill the product. If you can make a software or something that connects to those systems, makes the reporting easier, you have a real product. So then you go and implement that with these four or five or ten people that you have. You're trying to build a product with them. Every week you go back, there's a new version. It might take three months, doesn't matter. Make these people happy. They're going to be the customers that are going to be on your landing page with their logos eventually. So these ten are kings. You give them for two and a half thousand dollars, you give them ten thousand dollars of service. Because it doesn't really matter. They're your first customers. You do anything for them. So when they're super happy, and you know you can replicate this, then you're going to go either fundraising or scaling up or whatever you do, you start building a company around it with software that you now know how to build that solves something.